Welcome to the bi-weekly StorageX Symposium. My name is Will Chu. I am the co-director of StorageX Initiative here at Stanford University, along with my colleague, uh, Professor Yi Tui. I am pleased to welcome everyone back. Today, um, we are very happy to be featuring two speakers to discuss advanced chemistry and architecture for battery technologies. Over the past couple of sessions, we have explored alternative ways of energy storage. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about heat. And today we are returning to battery technology by focusing on the next generation chemistry. And for our first talk, I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Eric Watzman from the University of Maryland. And I seem to be saying this quite a lot lately uh, Eric is also a proud alum of material science engineering at Stanford. Uh, he received his PhD training here. And Eric plays, a important, uh, plays several important leadership roles. He is the head of the University of Maryland Energy Institute. Uh, he's also on the board of the Electrochemical Society. Today, Eric's going to talk about solid state batteries which is a very promising next generation technology that he's trying to make current generation as well, both in the lab and at his startup. So Eric, I remember vividly you presented on this work maybe six or six or so years ago at Stanford uh, when you first uh, came out um, with um, the solid state architecture with the cathodes and the solid electrolytes. So I remember that vividly. And I have been watching the amazing progress over the past few years. And uh, today, we're really excited to hear from Eric on the latest progress for the solid state batteries uh, in his lab and in his company. Eric, please go ahead. So, so thank you, uh, Will, and also you for inviting me. Um, as, as Will mentioned, I actually graduated twice from, from, from Stanford. I actually started in chemical engineering, uh, did my research initially with Kurt Frank and then transition to uh, Dave Mason. Um, those of you who may not know Dave Mason, he founded the chemical engineering department at Stanford and I was his last graduate student before he passed away. Uh, and then transitioned to material science where I worked with, with Dave Stevenson and, and Bob Huggins, which I think most of you may be aware of. And so therefore my interest and, and my area of research has always been solid state ionics and, and that what got it really got its start uh, as a grad student at Stanford. And so I'm gonna talk about that, but before I, I, I go into um, the inside of the cell. I thought it was important to talk about the outside of the cell. Um, and in particular, um, uh, Tesla as an example. So I wanna say this in all the best ways possible. That's a picture of my first Tesla in my garage. I was so happy when I got that thing. That really is, is, is a, a, a wonderful invention. I think Elon got it right in trying to go for a car that people wanted. Um, versus trying to make it just a, a cheaper car that, that everybody could afford. Um, and, and, you know, it, it really was a, a technological marvel. And, and if you look at the batteries in, in that Tesla, uh, they would look like something like this. Um, and, and each of those packs that you see there fit in, in, in the carriage uh, under the car. Um, and, and what he did is he, he really just took thousands of, of what are called 18650 batteries. And, and you can see, you know, the, the image of one there, they're 18650s because they're 18 millimeters in diameter and 65 millimeters in length. And, and they're just put in series um, inside of this pack. Um, one of the issues though, by the way, is that because of this, there is a, a, a loss in energy density. So these are our uh, um, NCR 1860 cells from uh, Panasonic and, and you know they're 243 watt hours per kilogram for the cell, but the pack, is about 212 watts per kilogram. And so there's what we call a pack overhead. That's the loss or, or, or the additional mass due to all of the packaging to have all of these cells. Um, it's about 15%. And, and that's on a graph metric basis. Um, and, and, and why is that? Well, in fact, it's very important that you maintain the temperature of these cells. Um, and so they have to have a, a cooling system in it uh, to maintain the operating temperature. If it gets too low, with the current liquid electrolytes, you have a significant uh, uh, energy or power loss. Um, you can see that in the plot there from uh, uh, the manufacturer's battery data. 
you can also see that, that there's a big ohmic loss at, at, at uh, basically at, at zero capacity uh, because liquid okay. electrolytes will tend to freeze and, and reduce conductivity at lower temperature. And so you have a much lower uh, uh, energy that you can get and, and much lower power you can get out of these cells. And so they have to maintain a, a high enough operating temperature so that doesn't happen. But the other aspect of it is the liquid electrolytes. And, and here you can see the typical liquid electrolytes they have a flash point of, of 16 to 23, 33 degrees uh, C. So um, they can potentially catch fire. Um, and you can see the vapor pressure and how that increases the boiling point of these, these electrolytes. And, and that's why you've seen these types of things in the news. And so you can't also go at very high temperature and you're really limited in the operating temperature of, of these batteries so that you don't go too low, so that you get high enough power and you don't go too high so you don't have a, 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 a safety issue. Um, and to do that, not only do you have this mass, what they're doing is they fill it with a liquid which circulates through it, but then to flow that liquid, there's a parasitic power drain. And so when we talk about energies of batteries, we talk about coulombic efficiency, and, and that's true for the battery cycling itself, but the entire system efficiency has to include all of the temperature controls. So if you have to put power into uh, maintaining the temperature of the pack, but that's an additional uh, a reduction in the efficiency of going to electric vehicles. So that's the mass basis, but let's look at volumetric. And so these are the dimensions. And again, I got, I never took apart my Tesla battery, so I haven't measured this myself, but I went to a website and they gave the dimensions for, for that particular battery pack. And I've, I've been showing it here. And, and so now what I've done is I've looked at sort of the, the top end of those things. Each of those green circles corresponds to one of the 18650 batteries. That's the, the diameter of it. Um, and, and you can see basically based on the way that they're packed in, in that uh, pack, uh, the, the, basically there's a 77% volume uh, pack overhead. Uh, they're only getting a, a small fraction of, uh, uh, well, they're taking more volume to enable the cooling um, than they would have if they were just packed spheres together. Okay, or back cylinders together. So what I'm also going to show you then is, is, is now what happens if rather than a cylindrical battery, uh, we, we had uh, uh, um, either pouch or prismatic cells, which are these sort of planar configuration. And the area, the cross-sectional area you see to the right of each of those little green rectangles is the exact same area as, as the area of, of the circles to the left. And so, you know, what I can do if, if they're flat like that, I can pack them and have the same spacing and so this would be this, this same 5.3 kilowatt hour pack, but now configured with a, a, a planar, um, either a pouch or, or, or a prismatic cells. And that would allow the same area for cooling for that fluid to flow through between them. Now, if I didn't have to cool them, in fact, I could pack them much more tightly. And now you can see the dramatic reduction in volume of the battery pack relative to what it currently is just by removing that need for cooling to maintain temperature. And in fact, there are further reductions in volume and mass that can happen uh, by going to what's called a bipolar stacking where we put all the cells in series um, using the configuration as shown to the right. So that's just to give you an idea about how changing the cell chemistry and therefore enabling different temperatures of operation can improve upon the overall system performance if I go within the cell, there's been a major driving force for going to lithium metal anodes. And, and so when we talk about future generation batteries, this has been considered uh, uh, you know, what, what needs to be done. And, and this is a paper by, by Paul Albertus and his, his colleagues when he was at RPE, which compares a, a typical cell on top to one that has lithium metal uh, below. And the advantage of lithium metal are a couple fold. One is uh, the, the carbon anode that's, that's typically there is actually a, a lithium uh, carbon six. And so if you take the mass of, of all of the, both the lithium and carbon, you get something on the order about 339 amp hours per kilogram for the anode. But if you go to lithium metal, well, you get rid of the carbon. Um, and the capacity goes to 3,861 amp hours per kilogram, basically a potential 10x reduction in anode mass. So I showed you the volumetric aspect. This is the mass aspect about why you would get better energy density um, by going to a lithium metal anode. Um, and of course, you also then have this reduction in anode volume which is shown there between the amount of lithium that would be sitting um, on the anode side of the, the, the separator uh, if it was just a pure uh, lithium metal anode versus having a, a graphitic um, anode. But in addition to that though, there is one issue and that's this issue about infinite volume expansion. 
how do you address that? If you go to a flat lithium foil for your anode and it cycles, and if you really do 100% depth of discharge on your lithium, you remove 100%. So the volume goes to zero of lithium and then it goes to 100% on every cycle. That, that's an infinite volume change every time. How do you package that cell to enable uh, that, that lithium to come in and out on, on a repeatable basis uh, with, without redepositing in places you don't want and how do you seal that? So these are problems with, with just going to straight lithium metal anode. Now, our approach uh, uh, to developing solid state batteries is using a garnet electrolyte. Um, and, and you can see the, the video in the middle. This is your conventional liquid electrolyte. We, this was done, um, I was interviewed by CBS News um, after some certain battery fires. And you can see how the liquid electrolyte just burns up. Um, it's a flammable liquid, but the garnet doesn't do anything. We, we center this in a furnace at over a thousand degrees centigrade. Um, you see some carbon deposits, but, but it's a completely non-flammable electrolyte. So that takes away that, that, that safety concern. Um, it has quite a uh, reasonable conductivity. Um, it's, you know, and, and also has a voltage stability all the way from lithium metal all the way to over six volts. It's made from inexpensive elements. Lanthanum and zirconium are pretty cheap. The most expensive material in, in the, the garnet is the lithium itself, which of course you're gonna have in any lithium battery. Plus of course you can have some dopants in there but they're there in a smaller concentration. But the other aspect of it again, is that it enables that lithium metal um, anode. It's stable again uh, uh, with the lithium metal, um, but also if it's processed in the right structure, it can block lithium dendrites. And so the, the figure to the left with the, the red, you know, through it is, is, is your typical uh, uh, polymer or, or organic electrolyte. You can see lithium dendrites propagating through causing a short. Um, in the case of the garnet, which you're seeing right now is a pore in the garnet filled with lithium metal. And, and I'll come back to that in, in a minute. So what's been limiting the, the successful development of salt state garnet batteries uh, since they have all of these wonderful advantages? One is a high specific solid solid interfacial impedance. And you can think about it by stacking stones on top of each other, right? Um, you have a gap between them. How do you get a, a uniform on an atomic level interface between two dissimilar ma uh, materials. The other is typically these things are, are, are pressed and, and, and centered disks, which are then polished. And you can see a, a photograph of one to the right and you have a planar interface. And because it's thick, the, the ohmic ASR is very large. And because it's planar, the interfacial area with the electrodes is very, very small. Both of those result in a very high impedance with, with typical uh, garnet electrolytes. And as a result of those two things, there's been limited demonstration of high energy density cells. So we developed a unique structure that, that we believe solves all of these issues. And, and there's a SEM photograph here. And I'm gonna go through some of the advantages of why it does what it does to, to address these particular issues. So the first thing is getting lithium metal to wet the interface. And so if you see um, the, the, the photograph in the middle, um, what we did is we took lithium foil, we put it on a garnet disc, we heat it up above 180 degrees C where lithium melts. And rather than being a flat foil, it balls up and forms a, a, a ball of lithium metal, which will just roll off. That's classical non-wetting. Um, and you can see the SEMs of the interface where in fact you can see the gaps that occur. So if I'm doing a, a macroscopic current density, um, really the microscopic current density at the points of contact is much higher uh, dependent upon the actual interfacial contact that we have. We developed a sm simple uh, atomic layer deposition technique. In this case, it was just alumina. And by putting uh, about five nanometer thick alumina across it, you can see on the figure on the right, how in fact lithium metal now wets. And we get a, a conformal coating of lithium across all the surface non-uniformities. Uh, the data to the uh, left is, is the impedance spectroscopy. The data with, in red is the one without the LD treatment. You can see it's well over 3,000 ohm centimeters squared, very, very high impedance interface. By doing the LD coding, it drops down to that little teeny uh, black uh, semicircle in the lower left corner, which we, we blow up to see what the impedance would be with the ALD. Um, the reason that we determined that's the case is in fact that all of these garnet materials, they're lithium conducting oxides, if exposed to even the smallest level of CO2, even that in the glove box, it likes to form surface carbonates and lithium metal just does not wet the, the carbonate. So we need to find ways to avoid forming a, forming a surface carbonate and, and the ALD does that. Okay, and so here's cycling data. The data to the left is now a, a constant current 
galvanostatic cycling, uh, the data in red without the LD treatment, you can exceed where, see where we're, we're getting over six volts in different cycles, uh, you know, again, towards the, the, the um, upper limit of the stability of the garnet, whereas after the ALD, it's basically looks like a flat line. So we've blown that up so you can see the symmetric square wave cycling we can obtain with that ALD process. With the data to the right is just showing you again at a higher current density, how, how uniform that is and how it can go on for hours and hours with, without any problem, a uh, very, very stable cycling. And if you subtract the, the electrolyte uh, impedance from the total cell from this symmetric cell, you get an interfacial impedance, which is on the order of about one ohm centimeter squared. Um, we've done this by a number of different techniques or, or a number of different materials, I should say, um, all with the same effect. Basically, the, this one here, you're seeing the effect uh, on, on, on um, using uh, uh, an additional uh, layer here. Um, and and uh, this is, is just a coated one of silicon. Uh, this is another one. Uh, this is aluminum. Again, the same thing, it wets, reduces the interfacial impedance and allows the, the thing to cycle at high current densities with, without any, any degradation. Uh, this is zinc oxide. Uh, uh, now we're starting to see a structured interface and I'll come back to this again. So overall, this is a critical thing. You're, 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 Two solids need to wet each other, and this is the case of lithium metal. And we've done this with oxides, we've done this with alloys, we've done this with liquids and gels. All of these, these overcome that intrinsic interfacial impedance by allowing a conformal coating of your electrode material on top of your electrolyte. But the other thing you need to do, or we've done, is develop a, a, a structure that allows the, the dense layer in the center to be thin and provides an extended three-dimensional network that you can then have higher a contact area for your electrodes. And this is done by very conventional ceramic processing called tape casting. We just mix the powder in appropriate solvents and binders. We cast them on a sheet. We laminate uh, uh, three layers in this case, dense layer in the center. Um, on the outer two layers, we put a pore former, it's just a polymer bead, which burns off in the, in the furnace. We put them into a furnace and fire them one step and we get the structure in the lower right. And this is just showing you a magnification of it. Uh, again, you can see how the dense layer is, is extremely dense. You'll see no grain batteries on it, no pores. Uh, it's about 15 microns thick, uh, a very low, small thickness that is supported by the pore support on either side. And so because it's so thin, the, the ohmic ASR is quite low. And because it provides now a, a continuous extended three-dimensional structure, it uh, increases the surface area for electrode electrolyte interface contact by about a factor of 50x on both sides, therefore reducing the interfacial um, ASR. And these can then be interfiltrated with whatever electrode material you want. And so sort of the, the one to the right is a cartoon where we're putting lithium metal on the bottom and our cathode material on the right, I mean, on, on the top. Um, and this is the case now we're filling with lithium metal on both sides. And so you can see the dark gray is lithium metal and the light uh, white is, is the garnet. You can see how well it fills that pore structure. Um, so it's easily filled. And, and, and this is now showing you that, that uh, single pore that I showed you before. Um, because we wet the surface, you can see how the lithium actually prefers to touch the garnet surface versus itself. And so this enables us to cycle this lithium metal back and forth by a pore filling emptying mechanism removing that issue about infinite volume expansion that you would have if you had a lithium foil for your anode. Um, so now combining these two things of, of that three-dimensional structure with the surface uh, uh, coating, we're able to go to quite high current densities. And so the data on the left is, is the center of that is the current density at one, two, and three milliamps per square centimeter. Um, and the data on top is, is the corresponding voltage and at the bottom, is the ASR of that cell. And what we did is we then, at three milliamps per square centimeter, went to more and more time on each cycle corresponding to more and more capacity of lithium cycling. We're going up to three and a quarter milliamp hours per square centimeter, which is you know, 10, 15 microns of, of, of lithium that cycled with no degradation or performance decay. And the figure to the right now is a plot of the area specific resistance for these symmetric cells versus the thickness of the dense layer. The dashed red line is the conductivity of the garnet. And then the blue data is various different thickness samples that we made. Um, and you can see how well they fit that line. That basically what you're seeing is just the, the ohmic ASR of these things. 
Uh, with the tape casting, it's a quite uniform thickness, so you'll see the error bars are quite small, whereas with the other ones, are those polished discs, and they tend to have uh, greater thickness non-uniformity, and that's why the error, error bars in thickness is greater. Um, and, and the other aspect of it, with this type of structure, you'll notice that the dashed line in gray, that's your typical ASR for an 18650 battery. So we now are achieving uh, 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 ohmic ASRs uh, for both the, the electrolyte and uh, anode interface that are less than that of your typical 18650 battery, enabling the potential for high power density with, with these solid state cells. So we've taken it beyond that. This is now data at 10 milliamps per square centimeter. Again, very stable cycling. Um, and what we did uh, with this one is, is then we ran this for, for hundreds of hours. We switched over and did that, that, that same thing where we increased the amount of lithium cycle on each pass, but in fact, took it all the way to, to seven and a half milliamp hours per square centimeter. Um, and this is what's called an exhaustion experiment. The, the pore volume is six milliamps per square centimeter. So you'll notice very stable cycling until we get to the point where we are literally stripping 100% of the lithium out of the pores. When all the lithium comes out of the pores, it no longer has that, that conductive path. And now the resistance goes up. Um, and, and these are one of the experiments we ran for RPE to confirm that there were no dendrites uh, with the lithium cycling cells. I'm um, going back to this, this paper by Paul Albertus, um, and, and he plotted here the, the, the plating current density that had been achieved in the literature um, versus the cumulative capacity, how long those things have been cycled. Um, there were a number of other circles I've grayed out because they weren't solid state, they, they were liquid ones. And it shows the, the, the targets that they have, the green one at, at three milliamps per square centimeter was the RPE ionic goal for his program. And then the one at 10 milliamps per square centimeter was the, the Department of Energy's Vehicle Technology Office fast charge goal. And you can see there's just a few um, uh, orange or, or yellow, red uh, 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 data points in the literature as far as lithium cycling. And the one that's at the highest current density in this paper is reference 11. And, and, and that in fact was our work uh, because at the time he was my, my program director. But since then we've exceeded that. Um, and as I showed you at 10 milliamps per square centimeter. So in fact, we're, as far as I know, we're the only uh, group that's achieved both the ionics and, and uh, vehicle technology fast charge goals for current density for lithium cycling at room temperature. I, I do wanna point out again, the room temperature aspect of this. We can cycle even faster at higher temperature, but, but uh, um, this is at room temperature. So this now is a, a, a platform for all kinds of cell chemistries. And so we have lithium metal in the anode, we have a garnet structure, and now we're trying different cathode chemistries to, to show the performance. And so here you can see some of our earlier cells using uh, LCO as, as a cathode material. You can see the cobalt inside of the garnet pores. Here's the corresponding uh, cycling data. The data above is, is the current density. The data below is the corresponding voltage. And, and this went on for, for well over 450 hours of cycling without any problem. Um, I, I'd also wanna point out that then what we did is we had a couple of different holds for 24 hours to demonstrate that it held 100% state of charge, uh, no voltage decay, again, confirming no dendrite shorting, both um, at the, the, the initial uh, cycling and at the end of the 400 something hours of cycling. The corresponding uh, Coulombic efficiency and capacity is shown here. Again, no capacity fade. Uh, this is one of our earlier cells, so it's a little bit more noisy, but again, demonstrating the ability for this type of technology to cycle uh, uh, with a lithium cobalt oxide cathode and lithium metal anode. Um, we later on tried some high voltage spinels. These are four and a half volt spinels. And you can see now much more stable data. Uh, this is 480 cycles. Uh, again, uh, great columbic efficiency and, and no capacity fade for 480 cycles. Um, we've even demonstrated this with the oxygen. Um, an advantage of our electrolyte is it does not get oxidized, uh, which is one of the issues with the liquid electrolytes. So this really does open up the potential for lit solid state lithium air batteries and it's something that I would like to pursue further. Most of our work now has been done with, with lithium sulfur. Um, we had a project funded by NASA where we did this. And so now we, we just fill sulfur, um, carbon for electronic conductivity and a little bit of liquid electrolyte to, to help with the interface on, on the cathode side and lithium metal on the anode side. You can see how we can get about 1200 milliamp hours per grams uh, because of the sulfur utilization we're able to get out of this. Um, again, great columbic efficiency and less than 20% capacity fade for over 600 cycles. Um, a lot of people worked on lithium sulfur batteries. They have a problem, it's called a polysulfide shuttle 
where the sulfides form on the cathode side and diffuse through the liquid to the anode side. Uh, again, because of that dense ceramic electrolyte, we, we block that polysulfide shuttle. And so theoretically, we should have very, very high stability with, with these types of cells. And this is some initial data to show that. The other aspect of that lithium uh, sulfur data is, is we, we, we also then measure over wide operating temperature range. And you hear now you can see cell data from minus 10 to, to 90 degrees centigrade. It uh, just follows a linear trend um, with no drop off on either end. Uh, a significant increase in energy density as we increase temperature. Uh, we achieve 280 watt hours per kilogram at room temperature and that's the total cell mass, both the both electrodes and the electrolyte. Um, at, at 90 degrees C, we're up to 350 watt hours per kilogram. And in fact, we could have gone higher. Um, the issue we had is the packaging can't take a higher temperature. So we're looking for right now for developing packaging that'll enable a, a wider operating temperature range. The battery itself is perfectly fine with that. It's, it's just the packaging. Um, and going back to my initial part of the presentation, this dramatically reduces the cost, complexity, mass, and volume requirements of current battery technology. If you don't have to cool the batteries, or you don't have to heat the batteries, you don't have to put in all the infrastructure, take up the mass and volume of doing that, and you remove all the parasitic power requirements of maintaining the temperature, you just let the battery equilibrate at whatever its operating temperature would be. Um, the other aspect of that is the safety. Um, again, these are non-flammable, but now you're seeing the ability to just cut these things open um, and, and there's no degradation, uh, they continue to perform without any problem. Um, We've also done this with titanium sulfide, which allows even higher temperature. And now you're seeing 1C cycling at 90 degrees C without any problem. And in fact, talk about safety. Uh, this is that titanium sulfide uh, cell under an open flame, absolutely uh, safe, no flame. Uh, uh, and in fact, it just, burn, it just shows a, a higher energy density because of the LED lights up farther. So um, we're also now making bilayer structures, which are a dense porous layer. Um, and the advantage of this versus the trial layers, this allows us to use commercial cathode materials like NMC. Um, and here's some initial results showing that. Um, and in fact, uh, we're able to achieve on the order of uh, well over 300 watt hours per kilogram on a gravimetric basis and about 1,000 watt hours per liter using a conventional NMC cathode on one side with the lithium metal and, and the dense uh, uh, supported uh, uh, garnet layer on the other side. So these are a transformative platform for a wide range of cathode chemistries, and we're scaling the fabrication and trying to commercialize it uh, through a company I founded, Iron Storage Systems. And now you can see the larger area of ceramics that we're doing this with. Um, and these are some of the specifications of the cells that the company is developing using this platform. The one on top is this, this, this bilayer where we're using uh, an NMC cathode. Um, we're achieving 265 water per kilogram. Um, but now completely safe because there's no non-flammable. It's a ceramic electrolyte uh, with, with all non-flammable uh, components to it. So it removes that safety concern. I show you some of the data for lithium sulfur, um, which again, we've achieved sort of 200 water hours per kilogram, but we are on track to get towards the 500 water hours per kilogram. And now the, these are, are, are uh, no nickel, no cobalt, uh, very, very cheap uh, cathode materials. And then again, the possibility of making really high temperature batteries. Uh, these can go 350 degrees C or so. So there are a number of unique applications um, that, that this would be, uh, again, uniquely uh, capable of addressing. And also the fact that we get so much higher uh, current density available uh, at the higher temperatures. This is, is uh, the one slide of some of the data for the NMC cells that are being made by uh, the company. Um, we're now currently scaling these things to, to 10 megawatt hour per year production levels. Um, you can see the data for the pouch cells, uh, uh, the number of cycles uh, and repeatability between cells uh, from this, this more you know, of a manufacturing process. Um, and we do plan on having prototypes available sometime Q1 of 2021 for a variety of, of interested partners. So with that, I wanna thank my, my colleagues, uh, Bing Hu at the University of Maryland who I've done a lot of work with. Venkat Thangadurai, University of Calgary. He's actually the, the, one of the inventors of the, the garnet material. Yifei Mo and Chen Cheng Wang, also at the University of Maryland. A whole list of, of students and postdocs, more than are listed here, but, but they're the ones that contributed to these slides. RPE for, for the funding, as well as DOE EERE, um, multiple uh, awards. I want to thank Tian Dong for that. The Battery 500, which again, that, that's one of the things that, that Stanford is taking the lead in. 
um, our city contract, NASA, Lockheed, Army Research Lab, and I need to do my uh, point and point out that I'm a founder and equity holder in ion storage systems. So um, just identifying my conflict of interest and I wanna thank you for your attention. Eric, thank you very much for that insightful talk. Uh, we have received more questions than we can cover. I thought I'd just start with a very high level question. One of the images you show, the cross-sectional SCM, looks exactly like a solid oxide fuel cell, which you're also very well known for. Maybe can you just briefly talk about the learnings that you have transferred between the two fields? So actually you're, you're right. I mean, it looks a lot like a solid oxide fuel cell. When I did my graduate work at Stanford, I was working on solid oxide fuel cells. And I went through this same learning curve where you saw the one image, which was that polished disks. That's what I started with, right? I was, was making those polished ceramic disks myself and everybody else working in the solid oxide fuel cell field. We're trying to figure out ways that we can make that electrolyte thinner. And so by depositing a thin layer on a, on a porous support that was uh, uh, enabled. And that's why the majority of solid oxide fuel cell com companies make a, a anode supported cell. Um, so uh, as it turned out, uh, Venkat Thangadurai, who I mentioned from Calgary, did a sabbatical with me at the University of Maryland. And, and as one of the inventors of the, the, the garnet material, we started talking about, well, what else can we do? And so uh, uh, we, we uh, uh, put our, our thoughts together and decided, you know what, that same structure for garnet would work perfectly well. We submitted our proposal to RPE, which was a little seedling, and you know you can see what it can't resulted from that. So it, it really is a direct uh, uh, evolution of the work that I did with solid oxide fuel cells. What a great story. Really, really great. Um, so let's dive into the technical questions, Eric. So um, the first question is on lithium metal penetration. So there's been many, many reports talking about lithium uh, fracturing the solid electrolyte, LLZO. Uh, there's many discussions of the critical current density. Um, so the question is, what is the current density in your composite electrode um, after you normalize for the surface area? Is it, I presume, far lower than that of a planar electrode? And is right. that the reason why you're not seeing uh, lithium penetration? So, so there's a whole variety of things that we've done, um, and, and that's one of them, right? The first thing was, was, was getting lithium metal to wet. So I showed you the SEM. If I didn't wet the surface, then what is your actual surface area? It's only a fraction of the actual surface area. And the vast majority of the literature out there with the dendrites did not get lithium to wet. So, you know, I, I, I question the value that they have for current density if they weren't actually achieving that wetting. Okay. Now, more recently, people all have been doing that. They've been trying a number of different techniques to get lithium metal to wet. And they still are getting, you know, uh, 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 current densities. You'll, you'll see in the literature, it's been going up. And there's some recent ones besides ourselves that are saying that they've got to 10 milliamps per square centimeter on a planar surface by simply uh, uh, removing the, the, the interfacial impedance by polishing and other techniques. Although I, I, you can't polish the inside of the pores, right? Um, the other is, as what you pointed out, was the surface area. So that's a, it's a factor of 50 increase in surface area. So if I'm you know, having 10 milliamps per square centimeter going through the cell, I've only got 1 50th of that going through the interfacial area and the dendrites form at the surface. So it's not, it's not a matter what the current density is through the dense layer in the center, it's what it is in all the surface points. And so you just take that 10 and you divide it by 50 and you're like at, at, at 0.2 milliamps per square centimeter instead of 10, okay? Um, there are other aspects of it also. Um, you know, a lot of the, the, the dendrites observed because there's surface flaws. And, and there, there's papers out there you can see where basically if they polished it with a, a 400 grit versus a 1000 grit, the, the, the sanding paper, the, the, the grit of it would change uh, the propensity for forming dendrites. So it's a surface flaws. In our process with, with the tape casting, and the, there, there is no, we don't touch the surface. It's buried in, in, in that pore structure, right? So we don't have any, any uh, uh, microscopic surface flaws. Um, and the other is that, that we, you'll, you'll notice from the SEM, there's no, no grain boundaries observable. So another uh, a propagation mechanism is through the grain boundaries. If you can proper, if you can process your ceramic and avoid grain boundaries, you, you you've taken away one of the, the the paths where dendrites can propagate. Great, Eric. So maybe a follow up on that question. So you use the composite structure to lower the current density and better wetting, but you do pay a price um, in the volumetric and the graphometric energy density. Can you comment a bit on how big of a hit that is when you introduce the composite structure to the anode? Right. So um, on both sides, whether it's on, on, on just the anode for, for the bilayer or on both sides, if it's a trilayer, the uh, uh, volume fraction 
of the pores is between 50 and 70 percent. It's only a 30 volume percent or so of the, the, the garnet material. Um, and, and so the energy densities I, I, I reported to you were the actual then measured energy densities that includes the mass of the garnet. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if I was to go with just a lithium foil on the anode versus having that porous structure, um, I would have, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, a greater volumetric energy density, but it's only a factor, you know, a 50% hit, and it's a 10x improvement over the, the, the carbon, right? So it's, it's, it's a significantly better than, 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 than a graphitic anode. It's not as great, let's say, as it would have been with a planar lithium, but then how would you accommodate the lithium cycling every time and going from zero volume to 100% volume on every cycle? You have to build some structure in. So a lot of salt state batteries, what they do is they have a, a pack pressure, right? They, they put their cells under pressure to maintain contact, but that's now pack overhead because it's an additional expense, it's an additional structure, it's additional mass, additional cost. We don't pressurize our cell. Everything there is just sitting um, in its pouch without any applied pressure to it. And so that's a significant savings at the system level by, by doing it that way. So Eric, am I understanding correctly that at the systems level, um, the porous structure is highly competitive um, with other approaches for solid state batteries as well? Yeah. Okay. Again, if you can get rid of having to apply a pressure against your cell, that's a significant uh, mm -hmm. uh, savings um, in, in, again, mass and complexity of the system. Yeah. No, I, I, I really think this is the right way to look at it. You have to compare at the systems level rather than at the cell level. So um, uh, continuing on on the lithium uh, metal question, so um, you mentioned the importance of the wetting angle, and you showed a picture of um, melted lithium wetting or non-wetting a solid electrolyte. How does one go between the wetting angle and the surface energy between solid lithium? Um, how do you translate between the liquid and the solid lithium in that case, in terms of the surface energy? Right. Actually, I think that there was a paper by E where he looked at a variety of different coatings and, and looked at the wetting angle. We've not actually tried to quantify wetting angle. We just were looking at what's the, the different coating materials, what is the impedance we get, and does it wet or not? We've not yet gone through and analyzed the wetting angle. So I, I can't answer your question because we, you know, of all things we've done, that's just not something we've, we've gone and, and analyzed for each material what the wetting angle is. Right. Eric, I think the question was actually a slightly different one. I think the question concerns you, if you observe the wetting angle for liquid lithium, oh, is, is it going to be the solid, same? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that is how it, is that related? Yeah, I, I know the, the the solid interface is obviously going to be something different than the 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 liquid interface, but but it, it it does show you. And again, if you look at that that pore that I showed you with the lithium inside of the pore, it's a matter: of, does the lithium want to bond to itself, or does it want to bond to the garnet? Mm -hmm. And and that shows you, in fact, that the lithium actually. The surface energy is such that it prefers bonding to the, the, the garnet than it does to itself. Terrific. Maybe now moving to the cathodes. Um, how big is the chemistry play space for the uh, coatings? You showed a few, and you also showed a few for the anode as well. Um, is there a massive amount of coatings available? Um, how much are you trying to identify um, sort of the uh, unusual chemistry that can be the coating? Um, we're pretty much open to any cathode chemistry you can think of. We have the advantage that, that now we're stable to much higher voltage. And so I'm really hoping that somebody out there working on cathode chemistry is going to come up with a greater higher voltage than anything else out there, right? So five, six volts or potentially higher. We don't have an upper voltage limit that I know of yet. Um, but we've been trying all of them. Uh, uh, from a company perspective, we would rather use, you know, the NMC, which is sort of the state of the art because they're commercially available. We don't want to recreate uh, uh, the supply chain for, for, for providing the cathodes, but, you know, they all work. Again, lithium sulfur, lithium air, you really can't get any, at least theoretical energy density higher than lithium air, um, and, and that's quite potential. Um, you know, I've started now looking into some of the conversion cathodes, right? So that also is a possibility that, that those can work. Right. Um, so a lot, another related question on the cathodes, Eric. So how, uh, you didn't talk too much about the volume expansion and shrinkage of the cathode. Um, and I imagine that's quite important in the context of a solid composite as well. Um, can you speak to a little bit about the mitigation strategies uh, for maintaining contact? So that, that is the, the, the biggest issue. 
um, is the, the cathode electrolyte interface, all right? Um, and as you pointed out, they're, they're going to expand or contract within the pores. So one, in terms of just making sure you don't crack your, your, your cell, is you don't put more cathode material in the pores than it would be once it was fully lithiated, right? So with sulfur, for example, you put the sulfur in, um, it's not lithiated, and then it expands as it gets lithiated. So you got to make sure you don't put more volume of sulfur in than the pore itself can maintain once it's fully lithiated. In the case of some of the other cathode materials, which are already lithiated, it's not going to expand beyond that size because it's already lithiated. Okay. But it's also more difficult to get some of those lithiated compounds into the pores. And that's another reason why we're going towards the bilayer structure for NMC and other, other cathode materials like that. But the other issue then is, is how do you maintain good um, interfacial contact between the two phases, right? And, and, and how do you accommodate the, the, uh, the um, expansion that occurs uh, by the chemomechanics of, of cycling back and forth? Um, I'm happy to say that the, the one of the most recent uh, uh, ERE awards I've got is, is focused on addressing that. And we're looking at different interfacial layers that will overcome the, the impedance between that. But for right now, we've just been using a, a very, very little uh, catholite to bridge the gap between the cathode particles and, and the garnet so that if the cathode expands and contracts in the pores, then in fact, um, that liquid can accommodate um, that, that difference in, in, in expansion. But ultimately, you know, people would like to get to fully all solid state. Um, and there it's not just that, it's like, can you co-center these things with having, without having a reaction at the interface between your cathode material and garnet? And so we're making some progress, I think, on how we're able to address that also. Eric, one last fundamental question. I'd like to ask you a few more questions on manufacturability. Um, so the final fundamental question is, uh, there's been many discussions on partial electronic conductivity in L0, very small, but there's some, um, as being the culprit for um, lithium penetration and deposition uh, beneath the surface. Um, is this something that the coding can help address? Yeah, um, the, the coating can help address it. And, and again, there are a variety of different garnet compositions, right? So, you know, again, this is all psionics. Can you, can you adjust the composition, the defect equilibria to minimize the type of electronic conductivity that you observe? Um, and, and I've seen, you know, some of the results where they show some small level of electronic conductivity. And the way, when I presented, when they presented, I asked them, is that N-type or P-type, right? Because it's a different way of addressing electronic conductivity depending upon which side, and, and they don't have the answer to that. Now, and I have not yet looked into it more, but I mean, we've done this consistently through, again, my background in salt oxide fuel cells, how do you address N-type conductivity in Syria as an example, right? So is this N-type or P-type? That's gonna give you a different of method of adjusting electronic conductivity to minimize it with the correct doping. That work has not yet been done, but, but again, it's, it's very doable. You have to understand the defect equilibrium of the garnet materials, and then you can develop the right doping to address it. Great, thank you, Eric. So on to manufacturability, maybe just one or two questions on that. Can you talk about your learning so far if you're able to, uh, what are some of the biggest manufacturing issues that has to be addressed to take the scale up one level? So um, making solid oxide fuel cells is, is you know, I, I wouldn't, I'm not gonna say it's easy, uh, but you know, we've been able to scale those things up to hundred square centimeter cells in my lab. Um, uh, we made lots of these things and tested them. We're not yet at that level with the garnet um, because the, the sintering process is more complicated, okay? Um, when you sinter the ceramic for solid oxide fuel cell, uh, oxygen you know, comes out when you raise the temperature up, that's just your, your entropy. And then as it cools back down, the oxygen comes back in. When you heat up garnet, lithium oxide comes off, but it doesn't go back in, right? So there's an issue about how much excess lithium you have to have during the sintering process. Um, the other aspect is, is how do you manage the, 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 the warpage, right? So again, we've overcome that with the, the solid oxide fuel cells as we scaled it. This is something we're trying to do right now, where again, that's one of the advantages of the tri-layer where you got a porous dense porous structure, it's symmetric. So when you, when you heat it up and cool it back down, it, it will maintain flatness. But if you go to the bilayer structure, which is the one we want to get to, now you've got a dense layer on a porous layer. And so you have an asymmetry in, in, the, in the shrinkage during sintering. So maintaining flatness um, and, and maintaining the exact microstructure and doing it over a larger area are the primary issues we have for, for fabrication. Mm -hmm.
but but being able to to make large quantities of the material, the tape casting, the laminating, those are all very scalable processes. Now, Eric, I think one maybe crucial difference between solid oxide fuel cells and solid state batteries is the environmental sensitivity during manufacturing. Uh, do you think uh, this will be something that would limit the cost of the processing at some point? Um, actually, one of the advantages of, of, the, of this over conventional batteries is we don't use a dry run, right? So all of the processing of the garnet material is just done in air, um, even through, through the, the, the sintering process. In the sintering process, we have a controlled atmosphere mm -hmm. um, at that step. Um, but then we take it out of the furnace, you know, uh, we, 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 we have the, the techniques to be able to, to have it sitting out in, in atmosphere if we'd like, although we probably wouldn't want to because just we want to protect it. Um, but, but all of the processing of the ceramic it can be done in ambient atmosphere. It's only when you start putting in the electrodes that you actually have to transition to a dry room. Well, Eric, there's many more questions that we don't have time to answer today. I hope we can talk about some higher level points uh, in the panel discussion. So Eric, thank you so much again for sharing this great work and I'm gonna hand it back to E. Thank you. Great, well, thank you uh, Eric for the great talk. Uh, now let me uh, bring Zhenan to the stage. Let me do a short introduction. Uh, it's a great honor to introduce uh, Professor Zhenan Bauer at Chemical Engineering at Stanford University right here. Uh, of course, I have a long history of uh, collaboration with Zhenan. Um, Jinan is uh, the world expert in uh, polymer and inorganic materials. Uh, her claim of the fame all, has always been uh, skin electronics, soft electronics. About a decade ago, uh, Jinan uh, started to move into the battery field. Uh, and clearly after she joining the field, has she, has, uh, she has been making a very uh, innovative uh, contribution coming up uh, a lot of new ideas uh, to help the whole field and, and really move a lot of progress going. You know, uh, she started the uh, <clears throat> self-healing uh, type of idea. I was fortunate to collaborate with her on that. And uh, so many of you have seen great work coming out of Jenna's lab. So today is uh, absolutely a great honor to, to have her to, to speak. Um, also, due to her outstanding work over the years on, on many things, she just won so many, many awards. So let me just mention, you know, she's a member of National Academy of Engineering. So uh, uh, without further ado, I will let Zhenan take it from here. Uh, thanks, uh, Yi, so much. Uh, of course, uh, Yi has been uh, my collaborator um, uh, for so many years on the battery side and has been really great uh, uh, working in this uh, uh, new area. And um, uh, as Yi mentioned that I come from the uh, uh, kind of polymer science, polymer chemistry side. Uh, so um, our interest uh, is um, uh, in the battery area is really to um, uh, to see what are the unique contributions we might be able to make by uh, using our uh, tools on molecular design. So in this talk, uh, I'll show uh, two examples of um, uh, rational design of uh, electrolyte solvent molecules and also artificial uh, SEI for stable lithium metal anodes. You have already heard uh, from the previous talk that um, uh, the um, uh, future direction for high energy density uh, battery is uh, going to be moving towards lithium metal as the uh, anode. Uh, but of course, uh, compared to the uh, conventional uh, graphite based anode, uh, there's no longer a support that lithium can intercalate into. And uh, this becomes a, a layer of lithium Lithium that has to grow uh, from zero to a, a huge uh, uh, change in volume. And, and also, uh, in addition to that, uh, there are uh, potentially during this growth, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, side reactions might happen and lithium might grow into the dendrite and then cause uh, shorting and a lot of uh, issues uh, with um, the uh, stability and uh, safety issue. So that 
has been the main uh, challenge in um, uh, kind of bring uh, lithium metal uh, anode into uh, practical application. And then to reiterate the um, uh, two modes of instabilities uh, that are uh, really uh, important to address to uh, ensure stable lithium anode is one, uh, the um, uh, mechanical instability, the huge volume expansion uh, for the uh, growth, uh, during the growth of uh, lithium metal. And the other is the uh, chemical instability that is um, uh, the uh, side reactions that are taking place at interface. So these are two key uh, two modes of instabilities uh, that we need to address. And indeed, uh, there have been uh, a number of uh, approaches uh, that have been investigated uh, in literature, uh, and some have uh, uh, shown uh, great promise, uh, but still um, uh, no approach is uh, is able to meet all the requirements yet for uh, practical application. And uh, it, it's likely maybe all the approaches uh, have to be combined uh, eventually to solve this uh, big challenge. Uh, there are um, activities on modifying the electrodes and uh, coming up with a protecting layer artificial SEI to coat on the um, uh, lithium anode electrode. Uh, host material is a very active area of development uh, and also uh, in the solid state electrolyte uh, uh, area here I'm only talking about the um, uh, the polymer based uh, uh, and uh, in this case uh, people try to design tough polymer gels uh, as the uh, electrolyte uh, to uh, hope to suppress the, the dendrite uh, growth. So in our case, um, uh, we want to choose um, uh, some specific areas uh, where uh, we see a lot of um, uh, opportunities uh, for molecular design and try to understand what are the uh, rational molecular design rules uh, so that then we can, with uh, the, the gaining of uh, the understanding, then we can uh, over time uh, come up with uh, uh, better and the better uh, improved uh, systems. Uh, so two specific areas I'm going to be talking about are the electrolyte solvent design and the polymer coatings uh, uh, as the artificial uh, SCI. So traditionally, uh, the um, uh, electrolyte solvents uh, that have been used for lithium ion batteries uh, are these two classes. One is uh, carbonate based, and uh, this type of uh, electrolyte can tolerate uh, higher voltage, for example, NMC type of uh, cathode. Uh, but the problem is uh, it has uh, significant reactivity with lithium metal. And then uh, the other class is uh, ether-based. Uh, they um, uh, can give um, uh, reasonable stability for uh, cycling with um, uh, lithium metal, uh, but the uh, oxidative uh, stability uh, for this class of um, uh, electrolyte solvent is poor. It tends to have uh, oxidative reaction decomposition at the um, uh, cathode side. Uh, so uh, there have been um, a number of approaches uh, in literature uh, to uh, try to solve these issues. Uh, so for example, the um, uh, uh, very promising approach, one of them is a high concentration electrolyte. Um, so basically uh, using a very high concentration of uh, lithium salt and basically all the solvent molecules are participating uh, in solvating the salt and uh, then uh, therefore uh, reducing their reactivity um, uh, at, the, um, uh, at the electrode side. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, one of the drawbacks uh, is uh, because of the high viscosity of uh, this kind of high concentration electrolyte, uh, the ion conductivity can uh, suffer in this case. So the improved method uh, reported uh, by uh, uh, the uh, PNNL is a localized uh, high concentration electrolyte. Uh, so basically there is a solvent that 
uh, doesn't solvate the lithium uh, salt is added and uh, uh, the lithium salt is uh, uh, being hypothesized to be still uh, highly uh, concentrated in the uh, region uh, and the solvated by the uh, uh, carbonate or ether. Uh, but then uh, these uh, solvated region, high concentration solvated regions are uh, basically um, uh, dispersed in the non-solvating uh, solvent and uh, slowing down the reaction and the increasing the uh, uh, stability uh, towards uh, lithium metal. So these approaches uh, have shown great promise. Uh, we decided uh, to approach this uh, uh, from a uh, systematic uh, uh, way. Uh, so here uh, we started uh, by first investigating uh, the um, how does how do we first tune the salvation of lithium and how does that impact the uh, uh, deposition. Uh, so here in this case uh, we uh, take the uh, uh, DOL uh, ether based uh, solvent uh, and uh, uh, then we uh, added uh, different non-solvating um, solvent uh, such as hexene, cyclohexene, uh, and uh, uh, toluene. And then we use uh, lithium NMR to study how these uh, solvent uh, can uh, solvate the lithium. Uh, so towards the right side is the um, uh, upfield shift of the lithium uh, peak in NMR, and that's a more solvated case. Uh, so we see that um, uh, the solvation of uh, lithium is very sensitive uh, to the composition. Uh, the, even the ratio between the DOL and the hexene can significantly change the solvation. Uh, and uh, in general, uh, we found that uh, when we have um, a, a more solvated um, uh, case, uh, then we will have a uh, 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 the uh, um, uh, higher over potential, but the less solvated case, we have lower over potential uh, and uh, we have a longer cycling time and a more smooth uh, deposition in that case. So that's uh, um, uh, provide one uh, information that is uh, less solvated uh, lithium uh, might be uh, desirable for uh, improving the uh, uh, stability. And also uh, another aspect is the oxidative uh, stability. The first one is more lithium metal reactivity. The second one is um, oxidative uh, stability. And uh, here we made uh, uh, molecules uh, uh, that uh, has uh, fluorinated CF2 groups uh, incorporated into the ether. Uh, this uh, uh, provides electron withdrawing capability. And then uh, the um, uh, uh, acetylene oxide units uh, substituted are used for uh, uh, solvating the lithium ion and uh, allow transporting of the lithium ion. And here uh, we found that as we systematically change uh, the number of um, uh, CF2 groups incorporated, uh, then uh, we will uh, change the oxidative uh, potential of uh, uh, this uh, molecule. And the electron withdrawing effect can indeed help to make the uh, acetylene oxide uh, to be more stable towards a high voltage uh, uh, cathode such as uh, NMC uh, compared to the one without any fluoro substitution. So with uh, this information, we start thinking about uh, how can we design uh, electrolyte molecules uh, that can potentially provide uh, both um, high stability at the lithium metal side as well as oxidative uh, stability at the um, uh, cathode side. Uh, so um, the uh, traditional uh, ether solvent has this uh, DME structure. Uh, and then uh, we uh, asked the question of uh, if instead of uh, two, uh, CH2 groups, so we extend that to slightly longer, uh, what will happen? Uh, and we found that uh, this um, uh, actually uh, improved the the, um, um, uh, the high the oxidative uh, um, uh, oxidative uh, stability. And then further, we added the CF2 groups, uh, which provides uh, electron withdrawing groups, uh, which is supposed to uh, further pull away the electron from the oxygen. And how that how is that going to be? 
uh, impacting the uh, uh, lithium metal uh, based uh, uh, based electrode. Uh, so uh, when we prepare these uh, solutions uh, using these uh, three different solvent, immediately we can see uh, there's a, a big difference when we use the FDMB with uh, uh, electron withdrawing floral groups uh, substituted. You see a uh, dark color uh, here. Uh, and we were able to grow single crystals uh, by um, uh, using the uh, uh, lithium TF uh, as the uh, uh, salt. And uh, using the single crystal, we were able to see that in the new molecule, uh, interestingly, the um, salvation of the lithium is actually through uh, the chelation of uh, uh, oxygen and the floral atoms instead of the uh, typical two oxygen uh, chelating uh, to the lithium together. And this uh, uh, unique uh, uh, structure and also the incorporation of the floral atom uh, is uh, uh, responsible for the color change. And uh, <coughs> the, um, the structure for the lithium uh, FSI uh, is um, uh, shown here. This is uh, based on modeling. Uh, basically, again, the uh, oxygen and the fluoro are participating in the solvation. And the, then in each um, uh, solvated uh, lithium ion, we see that um, uh, there are two, uh, around the two FSI uh, uh, molecules uh, uh, involved in the, um, uh, in the solvation. Uh, and uh, the floral uh, group's uh, participation in the solvation can also be seen from the uh, shift in the floral NMR to confirm that it's indeed participating. Uh, and uh, this is uh, also can be uh, explained uh, by just looking at the electron density. Uh, this is modeling done by Jian Qing's group uh, in Stanford Chemical Engineering Department. And you can see in the FDMB, uh, the um, uh, uh, negative electron cloud are uh, localized on both oxygen and the floral, while the other uh, ether case uh, are entirely localized at oxygen. So so therefore, in other case, uh, only oxygen, uh, two oxygens are, are used to um, uh, chelate. And uh, in terms of the uh, voltage stability, uh, we observed that the uh, FDMB uh, can achieve uh, significantly uh, higher uh, stability compared to the uh, uh, other uh, previously reported uh, solvent. Uh, as we expected. Uh, and then uh, in terms of the uh, lithium metal uh, growth, uh, uh, you can also see that uh, the, um, uh, the growth morphology is significantly uh, changed. In the case of FDMB, we see more plate-like uh, growth, while uh, in the other two solvents, which uh, tend to have uh, uh, instability in chemical reaction with the lithium metal, uh, you would see those uh, dendrite-like uh, growth of um, uh, lithium metal. And here is the cryo uh, EM uh, to look at the SEI interface. Uh, with the new solvent, we see a very smooth, homogeneous, uh, and amorphous uh, uh, SEI that's um, uh, quite thin. It's only six nanometers. Um, and, and the left side is comparing to the traditional uh, the uh, uh, carbonate-based uh, electrolyte. Uh, and also, uh, I didn't show the XPS here, but the uh, SEI we found is um, uh, uh, more uh, anhydride the SEI and contains uh, 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 quite a lot of the floral groups and lithium fluoride. Uh, and this is likely due to the uh, uh, the fact that the FSI is participating in the uh, solvation in the lithium. There are two FSI incorporated uh, uh, in the solvation structure that might be incorporated uh, into the SEI. And this kind of uh, uh, smooth SEI uh, is, and also the uh, growth of the um, uh, plate like uh, lithium is uh, consistent with uh, what's previously reported uh, by Shelly Mong's group, uh, where they found that when the lithium uh, growth in this um, 
uh, more plate-like structure, it tend to have um, uh, higher columbic uh, efficiency uh, in, the, um, uh, in the cycling. And indeed, uh, this is what we observed. Uh, so here we build uh, full cells with um, lithium metal on one side. Uh, and this is a, a thin lithium metal. Uh, we tested uh, 25 micron uh, lithium metal and uh, uh, NMC as the cathode. Uh, so this is the high voltage cathode. Uh, and the full cell uh, uh, columbic efficiency we can achieve uh, is uh, uh, one of the best uh, reported in literature, 99. Uh, 6% and uh, with a very good uh, capacity uh, retention uh, here even after uh, 400 uh, uh, cycles. Also, uh, we were able to, um, uh, to use this um, uh, solvent to build uh, anode-free pouch cells. Uh, so in this case, uh, the anode-free cell basically doesn't need to start out with a foil of lithium. And that's, uh, uh, that can potentially uh, reduce the, um, uh, the, the volume and also the weight of the overall uh, cell. And uh, it, it's a very challenging uh, type of uh, uh, battery to build because uh, uh, if uh, the uh, electrolyte is not stable, uh, then the lithium will be quickly uh, consumed. The lithium supply from the uh, cathode will be quickly consumed and uh, will not be able to uh, maintain stability. Uh, but this um, uh, electrolyte can reach uh, high columbic efficiency after one or two cycles and therefore is able to uh, um, uh, to be one of the very few um, uh, solvent that actually enable anode-free uh, battery with a high cycling uh, stability. And here we have built such cells with uh, several different kind of uh, uh, commercially available uh, high energy density uh, NMC um, uh, cathode in the pouch cell geometry. Uh, so uh, with uh, just the electrolyte um, uh, uh, kind of approaching the electrolyte side is uh, one approach and uh, uh, just with the improving electrolyte uh, might not still might not be sufficient to really achieve uh, the uh, long-term stability that's needed. Uh, so at the same time, we're also uh, investigating the uh, rational design of um, artificial uh, SEIs for achieving uh, more stable lithium metal anode. Uh, and this SEI is um, uh, very important uh, because uh, it needs to accommodate the volume expansion of um, uh, lithium metal and the normal uh, SEI uh, formed uh, by the uh, reaction between the electrolyte and the lithium metal uh, tends to, to uh, be more rigid and uh, potentially during the volume expansion may, may form cracks uh, that leads to the dendrite growth. Uh, and also the SEI, if designed properly, uh, we hope it can prevent the reaction from the, uh, 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 from the uh, solvent molecule decomposition and uh, uh, also uh, be able to uh, help the chemical instability uh, problem. Uh, so um, uh, almost a, a decade ago, when we uh, started to work in uh, the um, uh, battery field, uh, the uh, very early work that we did in collaboration with the uh, East Group uh, uh, was to um, use a self-healing polymer, basically this polymer uh, that's um, uh, form a network through hydrogen bonding. And since uh, hydrogen bonding has a uh, weak bonding, uh, so it can break very readily, but it can also reform very readily at room temperature. Uh, and uh, this provides a uh, flowable and dynamic network. And uh, at the time, uh, we thought that uh, this uh, binder uh, for this, uh, for uh, silicon anode could potentially accommodate the large volume expansion 
of the uh, silicon particles and uh, result in more stable cycling. And indeed, that um, uh, give us uh, uh, quite promising results uh, uh, for silicon anode. Uh, so that motivated us to continue uh, work in this field and uh, explore the uh, potential of um, uh, polymer chemistry. Uh, so um, in the lithium metal side, uh, we thought that the self-healing polymer could also be uh, interesting to be applied as the uh, uh, protecting coating for lithium metal uh, because its flowable property, which um, uh, we characterize uh, using rheology. Uh, and uh, this polymer, uh, the microscope uh, image you show, uh, you see on the uh, lower right side, basically we poke a hole in the polymer and uh, over 60 seconds, uh, you can see the polymer already uh, uh, kind of move around and uh, flow over the hole and uh, seal the hole. Uh, so we thought that this unique property of this kind of uh, dynamic polymer could potentially seal any pinholes uh, on the surface of lithium metal uh, and um, uh, prevent the uh, uh, cracks in the in the layer and the prevent uh, and the result in the dendrite growth. And uh, the other question we asked is uh, maybe if we have this kind of uh, uh, polymer that may provide more uniform ion transport uh, and there's no hotspot for ion transport, it might uh, change the uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, ion uh, or the lithium metal deposition morphology altogether. Uh, so uh, to our um, delight that we found that our first try actually got uh, very exciting results uh, that uh, without polymer, we saw uh, the typical dendrite growth. Uh, and with polymer, we saw a very dense and a uniform layer of um, uh, lithium metal that's uh, grown on the surface. And indeed, it seems it's changing the morphology uh, of the uh, lithium deposition. Uh, and um, uh, we were also happy to find to see that, uh, that another student, uh, a postdoc of ease, uh, took another flowable polymer, dynamic polymer that's a uh, uh, silly uh, and uh, this one has the boron oxygen bond that's dynamic. And again, uh, this polymer uh, shows that uh, with the coating, it grows the nice plate like structure and uh, uh, start to give a much improved uh, uh, cycling for the lithium metal. So with those, we start, started to uh, study uh, what is really the role of uh, the chemistry and also the mechanical property of these um, polymer coatings. Uh, and we found that uh, the uh, one very important role of the uh, polymer design, having the dynamic cross-linking is indeed uh, macroscopically, we can achieve a much more uniform lithium uh, deposition without having um, the uh, non-uniformity that may arise uh, from the, uh, uh, if we have a rigid polymer, even though the polymer chemistry is almost the same, uh, but the non-uniformity of the polymer and the subsequent SEI formation could lead to uh, in um, uh, macroscopic regions, uh, non-uniformity of the lithium growth, even though in the local region, we see uh, same chemistry give uh, similar um, uh, nanostructures. And the other um, thing at the same time that uh, our colleague uh, Jian Qing has been uh, using uh, modeling to um, uh, investigate the role of uh, mechanical property of the uh, polymer coating. And uh, his modeling also suggests that uh, with the viscoelastic uh, polymer coating on the uh, surface of the lithium metal uh, tends to give um, uh, growth of uh, more more uh, densely and also uniform layer of uh, lithium metal to give the desired uh, morphology. 
so uh, these uh, information also coupled with um, uh, our systematic study of um, uh, the um, uh, uh, surface energy and the polarity and salvation of uh, various different polymer chemistry uh, to investigate their um, impact on the columbic efficiency that led us uh, to uh, conclude uh, that um, uh, for the desirable coding, uh, we should uh, keep the uh, uh, self-healing and uh, um, uh, flowable property that uh, comes from the dynamic uh, nature of the uh, polymer we design. This will be desirable for um, uh, addressing the mechanical instability in the, um, uh, uh, in the coding. Uh, and also uh, the, um, uh, uh, in, uh, the, the mechanical instability in the lithium metal anode. Uh, and then uh, uh, we need to have a, a good lithium ion conductivity and even better if single ion conductive, but at the same time, uh, in order to prevent the reaction from the uh, reactive electrolyte solvent, uh, then we will want this layer of polymer to be non-swelling uh, by the electrolyte solvent, but yet still able to transport ions through these uh, single ion uh, conductive channels. Uh, so that sounds like conflicting uh, kind of um, requirements, uh, uh, but uh, indeed uh, we were able to come up with the uh, appropriate um, design of the system. Uh, so here uh, we have the uh, aluminum center uh, coordinated uh, with uh, four oxygen. Uh, so that to create a negative uh, charge. Uh, so then that would become the uh, um, uh, site that can uh, uh, solvate the lithium ion and uh, uh, allow the transport of lithium ion in the single ion conductive mode uh, because uh, these uh, sites are being uh, localized in the polymer network. And then we choose the uh, uh, polymer backbone to have these uh, floral ethers. Uh, and if it's all floral ether based, uh, then it doesn't solvate lithium ion uh, in that case. Uh, so then, uh, and, and also it doesn't uh, swell by the solvent. So this provides a uh, network that doesn't swell, but has the single ion conductivity uh, from the um, aluminum side. Uh, and then um, the aluminum site is uh, also a dynamic site. Uh, to compare to this, uh, we also synthesize uh, uh, polymer that has the uh, boron oxygen site uh, that's uh, single ion conductive, uh, but it's uh, not, not a dynamic, it's a strong bonding. And uh, also uh, silicon oxygen site, this one doesn't carry any negative charge. So it's uh, non-single ion conductive and also non-dynamic. And we are able to determine uh, these um, uh, aluminum oxygen site as dynamic uh, by using both uh, NMR to characterize the association constant uh, and also DFT calculation to calculate the bond energy. So compared to the um, uh, boron oxygen and silicon oxygen, you can see much uh, lower uh, bond uh, energy. And carbon-carbon bond typically is in the order of 300. So this is a uh, half of that uh, and uh, therefore create a not, not very stable bond. So that's uh, why it has the dynamic uh, nature. Um, uh, so here, uh, I think my time is running out. I'll just go to the uh, uh, final stability uh, of the um, system. Uh, so you can see that um, uh, with um, uh, cycling with lithium metal, uh, if we uh, keep the um, uh, bare lithium metal without any coating uh, in the electrolyte, uh, then we will see that uh, uh, the um, uh, impedance uh, at the surface will keep increasing. This is because the formation of uh, uh, the uh, SU 
CI and it's keep uh, growing because of the uh, reaction and the, the uh, uh, impedance keep increasing. But with our uh, single ion conductive dynamic network, uh, this impedance change uh, uh, is uh, very small over time. And indeed it gives uh, uh, stable uh, cycling uh, by using this uh, coding. And uh, this coding compared to those reported, uh, there are a number of codings reported in literature. And uh, this is um, uh, one of the uh, uh, best uh, currently uh, without, if we don't use any other tricks uh, such as a 3D host or other um, uh, kind of special electrolyte. And here uh, we're just simply uh, using the conventional uh, uh, carbonate electrolyte and we, uh, are achieving one of the best uh, uh, performance uh, for uh, full cell cycling. Okay, and uh, again, uh, growth is this uh, plate-like uh, structure. So to summarize uh, here, uh, I've shown uh, two examples of uh, rational molecular design of uh, electrolyte molecules and also artificial uh, SEI. Uh, our finding is that it's very important to, to tune the uh, uh, salvation of lithium in all of these um, uh, systems. Uh, uh, and uh, the weakened salvation in the uh, solvent uh, we design and also the uh, incorporation of the uh, anion into the salvation structure uh, lead to anion uh, enriched uh, SEI. We, uh, this is uh, 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 the, the reason we think is uh, um, uh, enabling uh, stable cycling. Uh, and then in terms of the artificial SEI, uh, the approach of using dynamic polymers and then combined with um, uh, chemistry to design a stable uh, polymer network uh, is, uh, is the key, we think, to achieve um, a stable lithium metal artificial SEI. And ultimately, uh, these approaches are probably uh, we're investigating one at a time, one parameter at a time. Ultimately, I, I see that uh, potentially they might need to be combined together to realize um, uh, the uh, uh, stable lithium metal. Uh, uh, anode. Uh, so finally, I'd like to uh, thank the support from uh, DOE, EERE, uh, the BMR program, and also the uh, uh, Battery 500 program. Uh, my collaborators are mainly uh, East Group, uh, E-Trace Group on the battery uh, side, uh, and also Jian Qing's group on theory. And uh, uh, these are the uh, students and postdocs uh, who are uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, the key players uh, in our battery work. And thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Jenan, for a very nice talk on using organic materials to uh, improve the batteries. Um, you know, we have a number of participants in Zoom right here, but we have a lot more that are watching in a, through another channel. Uh, I think the questions are starting to flow in. Uh, let me start by uh, asking uh, the first question, uh, first set of question related to the organic electrolyte. Um, there's a question related to FDMB. Uh, the audience asked FDMB and also a few other research groups recently demonstrate up to about 99.5 columbic efficiency. So this of course is excellent. Uh, and then we still need about roughly about 0.5% better columbic efficiency to go, to go get to 99.9% type of range. Um, so what's your thought about electrolyte engineering? How do we get there? How mm -hmm. do we get there? This is an excellent question. Yeah, is it the only approach or we need to combine with other approach to, to get there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, the um, uh, getting to a stable electrolyte, uh, liquid electrolyte, that's the uh, more near term goal uh, to enable the lithium metal based uh, battery. And um, many groups uh, have been working on different 
approaches uh, and, uh, and also our understanding uh, has been grown over time. And I, I, I think uh, the, um, uh, the approach of, uh, uh, for example, uh, high uh, concentration electrolyte and the localized high concentration electrolyte, uh, then those case, uh, um, uh, the um, uh, solvent molecules are based on the uh, commercial molecules or no molecules. And in our case, uh, we are, uh, focusing on uh, the rational design of these molecules uh, to make them stable uh, to begin with. Uh, so potentially one can imagine that uh, these approaches, uh, they don't really conflict with each other and they can uh, definitely potentially be uh, combined uh, to um, uh, to, to design more stable electrolyte. Uh, and uh, I think the, the challenge is that uh, the um, lithium uh, solvation is uh, uh, very uh, complicated and it's extremely sensitive uh, now uh, as we start working with uh, uh, these different solvent molecules. Uh, a simple change, one atom change in the molecule can um, uh, change uh, uh, the uh, lithium solvation structure completely. Uh, and that can have a huge impact uh, on the uh, stability and what's in, uh, the, the uh, nature of the SEI. Uh, so I, I think uh, uh, to, to make the long answer short, uh, I, I think a combination of uh, different approaches uh, uh, would definitely be um, a promising way to go and uh, uh, further understanding of uh, the uh, salvation structure and how we uh, tune the salvation structure, I think would be very important uh, uh, other direction as well. Yeah. So um, in the, still in the organic electrolyte uh, domain of this question, um, fluorine uh, is, a, you know, all this organic. Once you add in fluorine, something, oftentimes something good happen. In the history of the uh, uh, lithium ion battery, the electrolyte, like FEC, for example, uh, fluorinate ethylene carbonate is often used. Uh, you also shown FDMB, uh, fluorinated, uh, this either is, uh, has been very, very important. Uh, any thought about how to design fluorine-based molecules? So what would be the guiding, guiding principle right there to design fluorine-based molecules? Maybe it doesn't need to be fluorine, would chlorine make sense or other, other atoms, you know? And the electrolyte space, there's many try and arrows right there. There's a little bit of intuition, I think, guiding things moving. So mm -hmm. what, what's the thinking right now? How can we do better mm -hmm. uh, design based on what we know? Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, that's uh, very interesting. The uh, uh, fluorine atoms uh, seems to have uh, some uh, special uh, ability to result in promising electrolyte uh, solvents. Uh, and the uh, fluorine atom in, indeed is quite uh, unique because it's um, strong electron withdrawing groups. Uh, so, because uh, I come from the uh, uh, organic electronics field, uh, we use uh, fluoral atoms uh, and uh, fluoral substitution very frequently to tune uh, energy levels uh, of um, organic organic electronic molecules. And the floral um, atoms uh, are typically entirely electron withdrawing and very strong, even through multiple uh, bonds, it can still uh, result in the um, uh, electron withdrawing impact. Um, <coughs> uh, but in the case of um, chlorine uh, based uh, uh, and also fluorine based uh, uh, molecules uh, tend to have uh, uh, special solubility behavior. Uh, many of them only dissolve in uh, polar solvent or other fluorinated solvent um, uh, because of the uh, very electron activity. Uh, but uh, uh, with the chlorine atom, uh, they can uh, have both electron withdrawing impact uh, uh, through bonds 
uh, but can also have electron donating effect uh, through resonance uh, effect. Uh, so then their behavior um, uh, would be very different uh, from fluorine because uh, the uh, lone pair on the chlorine can actually um, uh, donate to potential, uh, potentially to lithium ion. Uh, and also uh, their solubility uh, becomes uh, much better in many uh, different uh, uh, solutions. Yeah, so um, I, I, I'm not sure whether uh, chlorinated solvents have been investigated uh, much, uh, but uh, I expect it will completely change the uh, solvation with uh, lithium ion. And, um, uh, and the other thing is, I guess the fluorine is uh, special, is uh, lithium fluoride has been found to be uh, very beneficial um, uh, to form stable SEI if incorporated into the SEI. Uh, and that might also be the other reason that the floral uh, solvent uh, tend to give uh, such good results so far. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, since we started the storage X symposium, our first speaker, uh, Professor Stan Wittingham, a uh, Stanford alum, uh, the Nobel Prize winner, has been the you know, first speaker, right? inaugural speaker, and also a, a strong supporter of the symposium. He's here every time or listening to the symposium, mm -hmm. including today. Stan asked a question about fluorine uh, again. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, fluorine you know, seems to be good you know, to, uh, to the batteries, but bad for the recycling and environment. What, what will be the solution if, uh, if we, we consider uh, you know, the fluorine issue down the road, yeah. Mm. Can, we, can we solve this? Uh, well, uh, the, um, uh, I, I think uh, certainly making uh, the molecule into, uh, into lower, uh, a higher boiling point would be helpful so that they don't just uh, escape uh, uh, during handling into the air during handling and, uh, 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 and, and also can be uh, recycled uh, much more easily. Uh, and then um, uh, down the road, uh, potentially uh, looking at other uh, alternatives. Uh, uh, now we understand that the electron withdrawing impact of uh, floral atoms are very important. Uh, there are um, certain other uh, organic functional groups uh, that also offer uh, strong electron withdrawing effects. Uh, but then the question is uh, their uh, stability, uh, chemical stability in the battery. That's still unknown, um, uh, but uh, they haven't been explored much. Uh, so I think uh, uh, those uh, that could be um, the other directions uh, to go. Yeah. So, so now let me move on to the polymer side of the questions. Um, about a decade ago, uh, you, you show this uh, soft dynamic bonding. Um, you know, it, it's good, uh, self-healing. Uh, we all know uh, in, the, in the polymer side of the, electric, of the battery field, a uh, uh, long time ago, John Newman and uh, Nitesh Bracera in Berkeley show, you know, using strong polymer mechanical force, you know, module needs to be higher than, you know, certain gigapascal in order to suppress dendron. Uh, so the, about a decade ago, this demonstration of cell healing, uh, you show, you know, it's an, the opposite philosophy to solve lithium metal problem. Uh, it would be great uh, for audience to learn about your thought. Mm -hmm. on the opposite way to, to solve the problem that polymer needs to be solved and dynamic. Yeah, just give you a chance to maybe explain, compare these two, two approaches. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, prediction uh, by Newman on the uh, high modulus uh, coding that can provide, uh, prevent uh, dendrite formation uh, has um, uh, that model takes into account of the uh, kinetics of the reaction. Uh, 
Um, uh, but then there are also other aspects, uh, uh, the diffusion uh, of, the, um, uh, of the lithium uh, for the reaction. That's also another important consideration. Uh, and then more recently, Linden Arches uh, group uh, has been developing model that looks uh, mostly at the transport issue of uh, lithium ion. Uh, and then in uh, our case, uh, and in reality, uh, the uh, transport as well as the uh, kinetics uh, uh, are all linked together. And uh, so our colleague uh, Jian Qing is developing a model that takes into account of uh, all these aspects. Uh, and um, in his model, uh, it uh, seems to suggest that uh, the, uh, and consistent with our observation uh, that the um, viscoelastic polymer uh, tends to be the one that gives the dense packing of uh, lithium deposition. Uh, and of course, uh, the uh, lithium deposition process is uh, very complicated uh, when it's below the, a, a polymer layer. Uh, and this really depends on uh, many factors. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, mechanical instability needs to be addressed, uh, and that uh, uh, is addressed by dy dynamic polymer. That, that, that aspect is uh, uh, more obvious to see. Uh, but then the chemical instability side, uh, it's basically chemical reaction uh, at the uh, lithium surface. And it depends on so many factors, uh, the salvation of the lithium, transport of the lithium, uh, depending on the ion uh, conductivity. And also that depends on the dynamics of the polymer, which can also impact the ion conductivity. Uh, and at the same time, if the solvent molecule diffuses through, this layer. So not only the polymer could be reacting, but then if the solvent molecules swell and it goes through uh, this polymer, uh, then the solvent molecule can also react. Uh, so in our coding design, we kind of uh, 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 took into account the obvious problems we can prevent. Uh, that is the uh, mechanical instability by using dynamic polymer and then uh, the uh, prevent solvent from getting to the lithium metal uh, using the uh, polymer network that doesn't get swell. Uh, I shouldn't say it doesn't swell at all. Still, we observe uh, uh, less than 5% of uh, solvent uptake uh, if we leave the polymer in the solvent. Uh, for long enough time. So that's why the solvent molecule stability is another thing that uh, we need to consider and then combine with this coding uh, would be the kind of the multi-pronged approach uh, to solve this uh, big challenge. That's great. I think your explanation uh, really helps also answering other questions the audience asking relate to mechanical properties, surface energy, conductivity, stability, which one is important. So I won't repeat that. Uh, so with this, what well, now thank you. Let me uh, uh, bring Eric uh, and also Will coming back to stage. Let's have a, a short uh, panel discussion. Uh, Eric, if you can turn on your camera. Uh, so I will hand this to maybe to Will first to ask the uh, first uh, panel question. Great, uh, E, thank you. And then thank you for the wonderful talk as well. So um, as I alluded to earlier in, in Eric's Q&A, um, both of you are coming from a field that is adjacent to energy storage when you started in the field. Um, I, I think this is a, a really great example of interdisciplinary research. And maybe Zena, you can also talk about um, what got you started in the battery field, coming from the polymer side. Uh, well, the um, uh, I, I was uh, working with uh, skin-inspired polymers. Uh, so we have uh, stretchable electronic polymers, self-healable electronic polymers. Uh, and uh, and our uh, 
approach uh, is always uh, when we um, uh, design some new materials, so we try to understand what's unique about them. Uh, and, and then uh, beyond the initial um, direction where we design them for, then once we understand their unique properties, we want to see where, uh, what are the other places uh, where these polymers uh, could be applied. Um, so uh, between uh, East group and my group, we uh, had um, um, uh, some work prior to this uh, on looking at uh, carbon materials uh, and also conducting hydrogels uh, uh, for uh, supercapacitors. Uh, so then um, when we had the self-healing polymers, uh, uh, then there are already, there already had been some collaboration with East group. Uh, uh, so then uh, it becomes something natural to think about, uh, oh, we have this new type of polymer, then uh, can we do something uh, in the um, uh, battery field? Uh, uh, and uh, then the postdocs, uh, uh, I, I, I remember, I think our postdocs, uh, East postdoc and my postdoc, they go to the dining hall together very frequently. <laughs> uh, and uh, then- The dining hall is an important part of the story. <laughs> Uh, so that uh, led to the very uh, initial collaboration of the first experiment and, and it worked. So then we continued and becoming more and more interesting uh, over time. So now we, are, uh, we, we really have a devoted effort to uh, study this. And it has been really fun. Eric, I also noted um, in many of your work on solid state battery also involve a very collaborative team by Maryland. In fact, I think you're responsible for growing and nucleating that team um, as the head of the Energy Institute. Can you talk a little bit about um, your thought process in building that uh, team up and, and making strategic uh, hiring uh, for your institute? Well, I mean, it, it, it was a natural thing that happened. Um, when I was brought to the Maryland, uh, actually Chen Sheng Wang was already here um, and he was really the first hire for the energy center. Um, and clearly you were familiar with his work in, in, in batteries, not solid state, but, but, but uh, the, the water and salt and, and the rest of those things. Um, then I was brought in and I was obviously most of my research was solid oxide fuel cells, but just really solid ion conducting materials. Um, and then I had the opportunity to make a, a number of, of strategic hires um, both directly for the center, which now is a state of Maryland Institute, but then also, you know, within multiple departments. And so the first one I hired was Bing Hu, who, again, another Stanford connection because uh, he was working as a postdoc with Yu Sui and, and Bob Huggins before that. Um, Thank you he, for hiring him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and he's really taken off. And, and so that, that, that was a great strategic hire. Uh, and, and then we, you know, we, we wanted to do more computational materials, like, like a lot of other universities. We brought an Yifei Mo. Uh, who, who had again had been working, you know, in, in, in computation a lot on these things with Gerd Cedar and others, um, and we just continued down that path. Um, most recently, we hired Paul Albertus, who you know, I, 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 I mentioned his paper several times. And he was my program director at RPE, but now he's the associate director of my institute. So uh, we, we just really, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it was a focus. It seemed natural. We had one of the DOE EFRCs on energy storage before, so it, it just seems like an opportunity to grow on a strength. Yeah, I, I want the young students to hear about your comment. That this is great, and and seeing uh, how the young people, uh, you know, grow into the pipeline and really bubble up, become superstar in the field. Yeah. It, you know, there, there's a lot of opportunity, and now we, we you know we're spinning off people that are going into other universities and 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 opportunities in the energy field. So you know, um, it, it's a great opportunity. It's 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 the place to be. I think to me. This is the most important work I could be doing. Um, and I'm excited every day to go into, I would say go into the office, but because of COVID, it's my home office. But but still, you know, it gets me up early in the morning. Um, I, I, I literally get up at like 3.30 in the morning every day and look forward to work every day. So I, I couldn't think of anything else I'd rather be doing. Now I know uh, if I want to find you, this is a very convenient time to uh, get to get to you. So if I look at four of us, uh, well, where you ask this great question, you know, Zunan uh, moving to the battery field, you look at all four of us right here in, in, in the panel, we all come from different fields and started to work on batteries. So that's uh, very interesting. Um, now let me uh, ask uh, uh, another question to both Zunan and Eric. Um, Zunan, you are doing, Organic, you're doing organic electrolyte polymer. 
uh, area you are doing ceramics, you know, solid state. Uh, uh, I want to, you know, probe on both of you a little bit. You know, certainly I can see the solid state value. I can also see continuous uh, organic electrolyte path. If you compare these two, organic electrolyte, uh, you know, having the safety issue right there, uh, and uh, as one of the main downside, you know, keep concerning the whole field of application, solid state is safer. So what if people can make organic electrolyte much safer? Would that be a you know, strong con contenders you know, to say, well, solid state you know, you will reduce uh, the uh, desire to do solid state? Well, I want to give you guys the chance to express your thought. This is not a conclusion. This is a just, a, I think, discussion. Uh, Mutually, how so now? How do you think about solid state and Eric? How do you think about liquid electrolyte? Right, having a little bit of discussion. I th it sounds like you're trying to inflame an argument. It's to me. <laughs> That's exactly the point, <laughs> but in a very friendly way. <laughs> um, I if I my I, I, batteries are, are a huge market and opportunity, and and, and I'm not going to say that one battery is going to be the solution for all. Um, you know, they would start off with all kinds of batteries and lithium ion just took over everything. And, you know, it's going in areas that we didn't expect it would. It's doing grid storage. That was not the expectation for lithium ion batteries. It was because of its lower mass it went into obviously initially consumer electronics and then into the automotive. But people thought that other things would be doing grid scale storage, you know, but because the volume has increased, the cost has come down and it's competitive. But there's so many other markets that we not, not thought about getting into in the past. And so, for example, with the solid state, the high temperature capability is really unique. Now, I personally want to believe that it's going to take over all markets, but I'm not you know, going to say that it is because there's a lot of competition. Polymers are great. There's nothing against them and, and they have their, their opportunities. Yes, they're more flammable. Maybe you can make a, a non-flammable polymer. But you know the high temperature end of things. I don't think there's anything you can compete. I mean, I showed you a battery operating under a direct open flame in air, um, and and so you know there's space, there's military, there's other types of applications, downhole drilling, things like that. If you want to integrate a battery with a heat source, let's say you want to actually put a battery. You know, talk about the 48 volts for 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 automotive that you can put a battery under the hood, and it's still. Uh, uh, internal combustion engine, but it provides a start-stop capability. You can't put a lithium-ion battery under the hood. I don't care if it's polymer electrolyte or not. Um, that, that, that type of high temperature, you can put ours there. So there's markets for all of them. Um, and I think in all of them, they're going to take the niche market where their performance makes them the winner. And, and then we'll see how, with time, each of them expands in other markets, depending upon cost and other factors. Yeah, I completely agree with uh, Eric that e each approach uh, has uh, its um, uh, pros and cons. And uh, But then uh, the uh, market is so huge. Uh, there are so many areas uh, needs a uh, battery. Uh, and uh, to me, uh, I'm very interested in also uh, batteries uh, for wearables and uh, implantables uh, and uh, where we want to have uh, uh, flexible batteries and stretchable batteries. Uh, so those uh, might be areas uh, that organic uh, can uh, play a very important role. Uh, and um, uh, also, the um, I think for the uh, liquid uh, electrolyte uh, uh, based on small molecules, uh, even though the current commercial ones are flammable, but uh, many of the newer versions uh, of uh, high performance electrolytes are more stable and uh, non-flammable. Uh, so it's very promising. And that infrastructure of uh, making battery is already there. Uh, so they, if they reach the stability requirement, uh, then they can be incorporated into commercial battery very quickly. Uh, then over longer term, uh, probably there will be all these new generations of um, uh, solid, uh, solid state electrolyte, uh, inorganic or could be polymer. Uh, then they will each find their own niche to serve the uh, space where uh, there's a gap. Uh, or there's a strong need that will pull them in. It's a great answer. Thank you. Uh, back to Will. 
Well, Danan, I was uh, very intrigued by your, by your statement that um, many of the liquid electrolytes are drop-in solutions for existing um, battery factories. Um, and, you know, maybe to you, Eric, I think the capital intensity of ramping up a different production system for solid state battery um, must be daunting. Um, so since uh, in, in our StorageX initiative, we also touch upon business and policy, can you maybe discuss a little bit what might be needed in terms of um, support from government or regulations or policy that can help with the scale of challenges of something that's not drop in? So, um, you know, I'm gonna give you the US centric answer to that one, right? Uh, we are competing on a, on a global stage and we know where you know battery manufacturing is dominated. It's, it's in Asia, I mean, that, that's the case. And so you make a drop in solution, where's it gonna be deployed first in the existing infrastructure. So it's not really gonna help US competitiveness, but if you develop a new technology where now it's not currently being used in the battery industry like we're doing, in fact, it, it is an advantage for US competitiveness because it doesn't exist in the other place. It's not a drop in solution that's gonna be taken over by CATL, at least not immediately, right? I mean, I'm not gonna say long-term that how markets will pan out. So that, that is an advantage, right? That, that it is a different infrastructure. It does have different markets to address initially. So again, starting a new company, going for the markets where our performance provides an advantage and we're not as cost sensitive, then, then it's perfectly fine. How it goes long-term in the scale up, that, that's, a, that's a volume thing. Um, costs and all of these things always drops as, as the volume of the market goes up, as the, you know, the, the percentage of the market you capture. So it's not an inherently expensive process compared to conventional batteries. Again, I mentioned before, the ability to avoid the dry room for a large part of the processing is a significant cost advantage. People make you know, ceramics in large quantities, technical ceramics, the, the industry, the, the, the supply chain is there to do it. It just hasn't yet been done for batteries. So you know, we'll, we'll find out how, how, how it all pans out in, in the future, but I still think that uh, for the markets we're looking at as a company, um, the US manufacturing aspect of it, that, that we can make a profitable company and we will see how, as we expand volume of market of, of manufacturing, how that competes in, in the long term. Well, the future is certainly very bright. Um, well, I think we have come to the end of our time here. And uh, Zenan and Eric, I'd like to thank you both again for taking your uh, morning uh, to talk to our audience here. And uh, Justin, if I can have the introductory slide, please. So I'd like to um, remind people that we do not have a seminar uh, two weeks from now because of Thanksgiving, uh, early happy holidays uh, to you that celebrate. And um, on December 4th, we will return to our X equals question mark series. Uh, this is going to be X equals longer duration storage. And we are very happy to feature um, two leaders uh, working in the area of long duration storage, uh, Mike Aziz from Harvard University and George Crabtree from Argonne National Lab, who also is the director um, for the Joint Center for Energy Storage. And I hope you will join us then. And Thank you again for tuning in today. Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you very much, Eric, and good to Nan.